today's episode of the podcast, I'm joined by Chef James Barry, CEO and founder of Pluck, which are ancestral superfood seasonings made with organic spices, herbs, and nutrient-rich organs. And it is freaking delicious. He's also an ex-celebrity chef for Hollywood A-listers like Tom Cruise and George Clooney, and has also written multiple cookbooks that are helping people thrive. James is deeply committed to reconnecting us as a society to our food sources, where it comes from, and ultimately educating us on how to eat to thrive. At the end of this episode, you're gonna understand more about how humans and our diets have evolved to shape the way we are now. Learn to be curious about nutrition and ultimately find out a diet that works for you. Five things anybody can do today to radically improve their health. The benefits of organ meats, other nutrient dense foods, and the role they play on our health. Ways to make healthy eating simple, practical, affordable, and delicious even if you have a busy schedule. How to recognize when certain foods aren't working for you. And why changing your health now is so important and how it can benefit future generations. Chef James is the man. You guys are going to take so much away from this episode. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to tune in. And if you find value in this video, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and share it with a friend who you think would find value in it. My ultimate goal in life is to inspire and empower 100 million people to live as the happiest, healthiest versions of themselves. Chef James has helped me with that mission, and I want you guys to be a part of it as well. I love you all. Now let's dive into it with Chef James. It's such a treat getting to do these in person. Oh my I, God. I honestly, for like the last three years, it's all been virtual for me. Dude, I know. That's why when we first connected, I was like, we got to wait and do it in person. Like, Amazing. There's, I'm so grateful that we have the platforms that we do to, you know, that you and I, we could have done this on Zoom, but I was like, you know, as many as I can do in person, it just makes it so much more fun, so much more meaningful. You just, there's such a deeper connection that you can have with somebody sitting face to face, a couple feet apart. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, do you feel like it's almost like you're able to look into their eye, like into them a little bit more and kind of which softens and deepens the connection. Cause I feel like on zoom, you're looking at a camera and you're not really looking at the image, right? Cause if you look at the image, then your eyes are going below the camera. But I don't know. I feel like that, that is always a, I know. I always try to like position the zoom where it's like the, the person is just below the camera so like it doesn't look like i'm looking off centered somewhere yeah but even then you're it's almost like you're needing to look past the image yeah to create a connection with the audience whoever is watching the video it's super weird whereas now we just look at each other's eyes and it's like you could feel the emotion of that or whatever it is or the the feeling that comes yeah. with the humanity of looking at someone straight in the face yeah you feel that energy that energy exchange that connection it's interesting that we're starting talking about this regarding connection because it's something that I actually think is a huge issue around our food industry mm. is the, the disconnect between what we purchase, what we eat, and where it came from. I feel like it's huge. Like, you know, particularly uh, a lot of people, see, it's easy for those of us that are in the industry that have been in the industry for a long time. It's so easy for us to forget that most people don't think like or know what we know. Like you only know what you know. And I just traveled uh, across the country from the West Coast to the East Coast during the month of July. And I definitely saw that there's a lot of states, a lot of cities where people don't have the options that we do on the coast that don't even have the consciousness of certain health paradigms because it's not even available. It's just not even available to them. So why would it's if it's not available to you, then that means you don't desire. You're you're not asking for it because they would supply it if you were asking for it because these businesses want to make money. So that means you're you're not asking for it because you don't know to ask for it. It's now not in your zygus. It's not it's not in your vision. It's not in your 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 reality. And so that clearly means that there is a disconnect between what the food you choose to put in your mouth and how it affects your health. There's mm -hmm. a complete disconnect, let alone the disconnect of like a lot of people don't even realize where they're, if they're eating meat, they don't realize what part of the animal it's from. Sometimes they don't even know what animal, like some kids don't even realize pork is from a pig. They don't, they literally don't know. So I think a lot of us in this industry forget that most of America is suffering, is chronically ill, is hugely overweight, and doesn't even know it doesn't even they're not even aware of it so i don't know i've been thinking about that a lot lately of like well so how do i support the person that may not actually even be listening to this podcast mm -hmm. like how do i support them when did you first realize that this was a problem that disconnect between 
humans and what we're choosing to eat? Probably. Well, it's definitely like an onion, right? So like I, I, I started out as a chef over 20 years ago. I went to culinary school before that even happened in my early twenties. So not just a little bit younger than you are now. I, I had, I got a kidney stone. I was just out of college. I was at the time an actor and I was doing, I was going to, I was doing the Williamstown theater festival in Massachusetts, which was a huge deal. It's a very prominent, uh, prestigious theater company. And I was so grateful to be there. And I was there two weeks, hardly, I was becoming friends with my, my, um, fellow actors, but I really didn't know anyone. And I was 3000, 3000 miles away from my family. And I got the most intense pain I've ever had before. Uh, cause a kidney stone is like kind of like the closest a male can get to having a baby, which is still not close. Um, and, and yet it was incredibly painful. It's basically like, a, it's like a calcium or mineral stone that's collected in your body and is now trying to get out and it's going through your urinary tract. Oh. And it's literally like probably like the size of a match head, or at least mine was. Some are a lot bigger. And it's going through a tube that's not at all that big. And the pressure and pain is so immense. And I didn't know what it was. So I was at this dormitory at the Williamstown Theater Festival. And I'm like crouching inside. My friend's like, what's wrong? And I'm like... I just feel like I'm constantly, like, I feel like I have to take a shit. Like, I literally <laughs> thought, I'm like, I just have to, like, poop or fart. Something needs to come out. And he's like, he's laughing at me. We're joking at first. But then, like, two hours later, I'm still in that position. I'm sweating. I'm, like, even in more pain. He's like, dude, something's wrong. Like, people don't do this for this long when they have something that's ready to come out. Like, something's going on. And I'm like, I think you're right. And went to the hospital and, and even when I got to the hospital, they were like, okay, it could be your appendix or it could be a, 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 a kidney stone. They didn't know at that moment. Um, and then I learned it was a kidney stone and then I was incredibly fortunate, but I asked a question that to the doctor that changed my entire life. I said, how did I get this? How, how did I get this? And what do I do to not get it again? And luckily my doctor or the person that was in the room said, well, what have you been eating and drinking? Like, how many doctors ask you? I was going to say, the fact that they even ask you that, they were they were a step ahead. I mean, this is a long time ago, too. Yeah, wow. And um, this is like 95. Yeah, you don't even hear doctors saying that now. And the fact that they asked that, and I was like, well, I just, you know, I just graduated from college, and I, it was a really intense period of trying to get out of college. I had to leave two weeks early to go to this theater company, so I had to do all my tests, uh, all my finals, just everything I had to finish two weeks early. So I was really stressed, and I was eating pizza and drinking root beer. Now, I did not know at the time that the food I ate was going to affect my health. I mean, I'm 21. I'm like, I thought that didn't matter. I mean, it never mattered before then. And this experience and him asking me that question, I was, and I said that to him, I said, well, I've been drinking root beer and eating pizza. And he was like, well, what about water? You're drinking water? I'm like, well, isn't there water in the root beer? Like, and that's something you hear coffee drinkers are always saying that. They're like, well, but isn't coffee mostly water? And it's like, no, 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 you still need to drink water. Like that's these, these, the potassium, all these different things in the soda are going to collect if you're not drinking enough water. And you're going to get a stone. And it's like, I mean, blew my mind. And from that moment on, I just, I, um, I carried water with me everywhere. And I started to be more conscious about, okay, the food that goes in my mouth, A, I'm in control of, and B, it directly affects my health and well-being. So now what do I do? You know, and now that's kind of, that shaded the rest of my life. Um, eventually I went to culinary school in New York. And well, even before that, I mean, I tried everything. Like I started going down the path of being um, vegan and I tried eating, uh, I was mostly eating tofu because they didn't even have all the fake meats they have now. So it was mostly tofu. And I noticed I was, it, I was living with my girlfriend at the time and I noticed my sex drive like went to zero. Mm. And I thought I was just depressed and she didn't understand it. And then skip ahead like three years and I'm in culinary school and they're talking about how, cause it was a, it was a unique culinary school where they're talking a lot about nutrition as well. And they're talking about how like, Oh, well, well, y you know, like tofu or soy could, it lowers your, um, testosterone and it can affect your sex drive and all this stuff. And I was like, Oh, well maybe 
that's why that was going on. And I mean, I just kept trying different things because I was exploring health. I was learning. And I think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of times, particularly when we're young, we get on these soapboxes of whatever it is that we're doing. And we go like, oh, this is working for me. So that means everyone should do it. And you kind of get on this diatribe or this, this, you, you, you get really extreme with whatever it is you're doing. And it's not that I was, I was not preaching to anyone at the time, but I definitely got extreme in the things, the choices I was making. Like when I went tofu wise, I went all soy, you know, when I, and then after that I went all poultry, <laughs> you know, I, mean? I just kind of went all in. And I think though, over time, it just kind of, what it did was it kind of indicated to me, like okay, I just, th there is something about being curious. And I think that there is a process we all go through that is the process or journey of our health. And we all need the dignity of that journey. And so like shaming someone for being plant-based or shaming someone for being carnivore, you know, either extreme is like, I don't know if that really helps because whatever that person's doing, they need to go through to then get to the other side. We need contrast. Like I, I wouldn't have known that all that soy didn't work for me unless I had gone down that path. And I wouldn't have known that chicken, all that chicken didn't work for me until I went down that path. You know, you know what I mean? And, and so as I've gotten older and even, even now that I, I really like, I would say that I definitely push whole animal, but I don't, I wouldn't tell you like you need to eat whole animal. I would just say, look, in my experience, whole animal is the most nutritious way to eat, but whatever you're doing is your choice. But, if you talk to like an anthropologist, like Dr. Bill Schindler, he wrote, uh, it, uh, eat like a human and he'll tell you, he'll be like, well, humans, we were, we were originally foragers then we were scavengers. And when we were scavengers, we did get some muscle meat, but it wasn't until we were predators and we got three things that really changed our, you know, our, evolved us. And those three things were blood, fat, and organs and those three things evolved us into the people we are now and it enabled us to not only have language it enabled us to have more tools we got fire around that time like it, it it's closest to the body we have now so that tells me oh okay well that probably means we need animal products but that still doesn't mean it, it, like what got us here is animal products but you still need to have the dignity of whatever your journey is with food and so I just rarely tell people this is how you're supposed to be. But I do try to say, like, I have some nieces that are, um, one of them's vegetarian. And, and all I told her is, like, I was like, look, all I ask is, yeah, have the journey. Whatever you're doing and why you think it's right, go for it. But all I ask is that when you do, when it stops working for you, please reach out because you potentially are doing harm to your body. Your body's not going to create as much hydrochloric acid when you're not eating animal products. And so when you go to eat animal products, what happens a lot for people that are going from plant-based to eating. Can you explain the hydrochloric acid and like the, what that is real quick? I mean, a little bit, I'm not a nutritionist, so I don't want to pretend, sure. but, but it, I've just been in the industry long enough, but yeah. it's something our bodies naturally create that helps us break down food, Got it. particularly animal protein. And it's, and it happens in our stomach. And, it's something your body naturally will do. But if you stop eating animal meat and or you're in a stressful life, like so lots of uh, modern living reduce the amount of hydrochloric acid our, our body will make and not eating meat will reduce the amount. So what happens, and this is not just around food, but you see it all the time, is people use their current situations to justify why whatever it is they're doing works or doesn't work, Right. We're looking for clues as to what path we should go on. And we're constantly looking outside of ourselves when I actually believe we should be looking inside ourselves. But so what happens a lot is people go plant-based and they do that long enough for now their body's not creating hydrochloric acid. And then when they go to, let's just say, eat that steak or something, and it's usually beef that they have trouble, they, they get... In, they get like digestive distress or they have issues with the digestion and they're, and they, they then use that as like a reason of why this is why I shouldn't eat beef. See, it doesn't work for my body. It's like, well, no, it doesn't work for your body right now because the diet you were on 
kind of made your body less optimal. Right. So now your body's not working as it should be. So you need support. And so that's all I just, I try to tell me, I'm like, look, just don't accept your conditions. Like when you are ready to um, change, give it a moment and ask for help. Like don't self-diagnose, don't just, like reach out to people that know what they're doing and, um, and support that change. And, and I don't even know how I got off on plant-based versus carnivore, but I, but I think ultimately what I'm sharing is that I, I, I went down quite the path in my 20 years in the health field. And even before that, just getting to it. And, and honestly, if anything I've noticed in my time, everyone, I have not met a single person yet. Everyone that is in this field of around any kind of health, health practitioner, anything like that, they're there for a reason. They're there because either they got sick or someone they, they loved got sick. And you can even like then do a jump from there and it gets even more interesting because then it becomes like, well, okay. So let's say you've been in the field and I've worked with a lot of practitioners and I'm married to one. And it's like, and, and what you then learn is that, and you could talk to literally any practitioner and then like, okay, so how do you elicit change in people? How do you get people to change their, their health habits? And most people will admit that you can't they have to do it and there's two reasons that will get someone to change they get sick or someone they love gets sick so it's exact same parameters and that that's a problem because you don't want to wait till you get sick right because some people get really sick and there's kind of sometimes there's no going back right um and so I really like more and more, even with my product with pluck and just how I talk about stuff. It's like, I'm really more and more just trying to get people to look for smoke, like, like kind of similar how to how he's talking about food. Like, like, first of all, you got to recognize that food is going to affect your health to then get to the next layer of that onion. Right. And then the next thing you got to kind of realize is like, okay, now that you're aware that what you put in your mouth affects your health. Now, what signs are you looking for in your health to show you that whatever you're eating or doing is not working? And, and there's lots, right? I mean, it could be skin, skin rashes. It could be, uh, red lines in your eyes. It could be dark lines under your eyes. It could be, um, aches and pains in your body it could be bloat. There's so many things, but there has to be first before we even like, it's almost like we have to make sure that people understand what those are so they can start looking for them. And then we got to get people to actually recognize, like own, take ownership of like, like looking in the mirror and like, and feeling, how do I feel today when I wake up? Like, how does it feel? Am I, do I have energy or am I groggy? And start, okay, I just ate breakfast. How did that make me feel? Do I feel now t more tired? Okay, that's a sign that you're, the food you're eating is not working. You probably had a blood sugar spike and now you're dropping, you know, some, there's something off, but we got to like, that's the smoke. And we got to help people see the smoke so that they don't wait for the fire. Yeah. To then do something different to make a change. Yeah. Like we got to make a change when there's smoke. hundred percent. Like you talk about that smoke. And I just think for, for a lot of people, myself included, we've been f fed, you know, no pun intended, but like, part of a you know special k like these like you know siri i'm not calling them out specifically but like you know part of a balanced breakfast you know like frosted flakes sure like, the food pyramid right, kind of sad food, which should be opposite yeah flip it up so flip it up on its head so i think for a lot of people it's like it's not their fault that totally that like this is what you know you think you know a, a bowl of frosted flakes with skim milk and a glass of orange juice like you think that that is a healthy balanced breakfast right and it's not their fault that, that that's what they've been taught but that's that's the smoke right there right so we got to clear that smoke so you know for us as people in the health and wellness space and you for somebody who's been in, in the field for much longer than I have how do we begin to clear that smoke yeah like I when I look at it now so I come at it from a different perspective than let's say even a nutritionist or 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 a, a you know a doctor or anything like that. I, I, I really come at so I'm a chef of 20 years, right? So I'm a very like how guy. Um, a lot of times, practitioners would ha get their clients or their or their um, 
yeah, their their clients um, or patients, depending on what they are, and they would diagnose or assess them, and then that patient or client would be like, okay, you're telling me I can't eat this, 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 and this, and you're telling me that this is going on, this is the chronic stuff that's going on, but how do I do that? Because you just told me all the things I eat, I'm not supposed to be eating or drinking. And so then that's where they bring me in because I'm the guy that, okay, you can't eat these 10 foods. I'll show you how to do it and still not feel deprived and feel like your life's not, you know, just a spiral into depression, you know, because the truth is we get very attached emotionally to food and our lifestyles. So I'm very much so. So a question like that, I look at it from a, a not a necessarily a scientific standpoint, but truly like, okay, what is what is what are the things that we can do daily that really are going to move the needle that you're going to that are maybe even simple movements but they're going to you're going to get the most bang for your buck and i and i look at it from truly a layman's terms like 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 okay you're not i'm not going to talk about food science around i'm going to just talk about habits and there's a handful that a lot of people don't realize they don't do they don't take the time to do but they really do move move the needle a lot more than people give it the credit for. And then the obvious one, and, th and this is one everyone is talking about more, but is sleep. And, and I even didn't realize this, you know, um, for most of my life is how important this sleep is. But I now get it that this sleep is for me, um, kind of like the first step to everything else. Like if I get good sleep, I make better health, food choices. When I have bad sleep, I grab the closest junk food I can because I just, I'm just like, I just need calories, right? Or whatever. I just, I just, uh, I, my cravings get control over me. Um, when I have good sleep, I, I'm not as stressed by sudden changes. When I have little sleep, sudden changes really stress me out. Um, I don't blow my top as quicker, you know? And so like, I, there's just, there's just a regulation that happens from that sleep. So that's always the first thing I'm like, if you're going to focus on any movement around making better decisions for your health, start with sleep. And then it's like, well, and then you can get really granular with that. It's like, but there's, there's a handful of things that, um, right away make some big movements, like having some, some. Uh, something that sh shades your room, like darkens your room. It really does work. Like having no light shine through truly works. Um, not watching screens before you go to like at least, you know, two, even th better three hours before you go to bed really works. And if you are watching screens, put on some of those, you know, blue light blocking glass. It really works. Um, having uh, sheets that are more natural fibers because we sweat and sometimes we get too hot. So the cooler you can keep your body. So not having the, making sure your heat turns off, you know, way before you go to bed. So you're not overheating that will help you sleep longer. So these little things are huge going to bed, eating, um, you know, ending your last meal at least by six. If you're going to bed at nine, you know, things like that. Um, huge, huge. So now you're getting better sleep. Then the next thing I would focus on is, okay, if you're eating a lot of processed foods, you're drinking a lot of processed um, drinks, try to cut that out. And I wouldn't try to do it all at once unless you're, you, you are someone who truly does better with that. Um, but I would conquer it one at a time. And the first one I focus on is what you're drinking. Just knock out everything but water at first. And if you have to ease into that, then for every soda, for every juice, for every coffee you drink, you're drinking double that amount of water, right? That's a simple start. Those are huge movements. Um, I, I'll tell this one story just about how water in itself can change. But there was this, this young kid when I, I used to have a meal delivery service in LA and there was this guy who was my friend who had, who was basically diagnosed with ADD. He was 19 at the time. He was diagnosed with ADD, um, had never held down a job really was just one of those guys always bouncing off the wall and, um, really good guy, but but he smoked, he drank lots of uh, sodas, had really bad acne. Um, and he, he, I hired him for my meal delivery and he started out just washing the dishes and he would see us making all this healthy food and he'd see, kind of see what we were doing and he got curious. And I didn't, I didn't push anything on him. I waited till he asked because when we ask questions, when we're ready to ask questions, that means we're ready to listen, right? 
all very important when you're talking about, you know, because it goes back to you can't force anyone to change. They've got to, they've got to want the change, right? So I waited till he asked. He asked. He said, "Hey, I want to, I want to understand what you guys are doing. Like, what you, what are you doing? Why are you doing all that stuff?" And and I said, "Well, um, let's let's make, you know, let's." We talked about it, and I was like, "Let's do one change, you know, if you're if you're open to it." And he's like, "Okay, yeah, yeah." I said, so how about instead of drinking the sodas I see you drink it every day, all you do is cut that out and drink water. That's it. I don't want you to do anything else but that. And he did. He made that change. And we never had another discussion. That was the only one we had. And from him just starting to drink more water, he eventually stopped smoking. He, he eventually, his skin started to clear out. He eventually got off his meds for ADD because he didn't need them anymore. I mean, this is over time. He then started working out in a gym. And now I've, I see him now. He, he holds down a job fine. He's a lot older now. This was a while ago. But, but I'm just saying that one change created this ripple effect that it knocked everything that was an issue out of the water. Like literally water fixed it for him. And so it can be that simple of a movement and it can extend from there. Like, like, like people talk about exercise, absolutely very important. Move your body. We're in a body. We, 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 we know we were born into this body and we know that when we die, this body doesn't go with us wherever we go, whatever happens. I don't know, but I do know that this body doesn't go with me. Right. That is the one thing we know about this life on this planet. So when I hear that and when I look at that, I philosophically go, well, then that means this life is about living in this body. That's what it's about. Whatever that means to someone. And it doesn't, you know, someone might be, well, what about paraplegics? It's like, no, that's still living. They're still in a body. And whatever is coming with that, that's what, that's how you're existing on this planet. So it, own it, you know, use it however you can. If it's only a finger you can move, great. But sometimes it's that restriction that is part of your lesson, right? Sometimes. And sometimes it's the ego, working through the ego, whatever it is. But I believe this life is about living in this body. And so um, I think exercise is extremely important, but we sometimes are jumping to, we're, we're all very harder on ourselves as humans. There's a lot of shame going on. So my whole thing is like, look, if you're going to do one thing, just go for a walk after you eat. That's it. Like that will do the same thing water did for my friend. That will initiate more activity. It, it guaranteed being outdoors, breathing in the air, you know, being in your senses, walking. It's going to help a lot. And um, once again, a little movement. Another thing that people uh, underestimate or don't put a lot of energy is, is, is meal planning. Huge movement. So when you meal plan, that basically means you're just, you're determining what you're you're eating all week. It helps you create a, uh, a a list for, you know, grocery list. So then now when you go to the grocery store, you're not making emotional purchases. You're buying what's on the list. And I guarantee it's not, you're not going to see ice cream and chocolate bar and hostess twink. It's not going to be on the list because it's not in the recipe, right? And, and then you also get to build that meal plan around your work week. And I think that's a mistake people make is they think, oh, I just need a meal plan. I'm like, no, no, you got to be looking at your schedule while you meal plan. Because if you have a day where you are uh, on calls working from nine to five straight, you have no breaks. Well, then that means you're going to get off that day and you're going to be extremely tired. And you're going to make poor dinner decisions if you haven't already planned it. So that day to me is a slow cooker day. That's, that's where you throw everything in a slow cooker in the, in the morning. When you're fresh, you set a timer on that slow cooker, you press go, and then at five, it's done. And maybe you, if you're eating vegetables, you throw some, you know, some greens in there that then um, the heat, the residual heat from the slow cooker will just wilt real quick and you're done. You're literally done. And you eat a, a home cooked meal where you control the ingredients that you pre plan so there's no decision uh, issues, decision fatigue, things like that. And these these are the little, the, the little movements that will truly affect your health and notice we hit all we hit all of them we hit sleep we hit stress we hit um food and um we hit exercise which are really the four pillars right you knocked it out of the park with that right there you just covered all four bases right because it's not one without the other like each one feeds into the other like you can't just focus on sleep and then you're eating like crap and then you're not exercising because in turn 
that's going to affect your sleep. So it all kind of works synergistically. Um, so I can see that there. I want to jump into Pluck and, you know, the product that you've created. You have it shown over there, <laughs> the organ-based seasoning. Where did that idea come from and why did you decide to make an organ-based seasoning? Yeah, it's um, it's been quite the journey because I did not grow up eating organ meats. Um I was a very picky eater. Like I tell people, like I didn't have my first taco till I was in college. You know what I mean? Like we used to go to a Mexican restaurant. I grew up in California, so there's um, a lot of Mexican restaurants and we would go to one and I would get a hamburger. <laughs> like I was really bad. Um, so didn't grow up with it. And, and as I already shared, I had that journey of kind of learning about food and, and really as a chef, I've always been very interested in helping people with their health, but, and also very aware that it's not about tricking people. Well, this is kind of a, a little bit of a gray area, but so, you know, like right now, keto is huge, right? And, and you can look at any diet, but what happens is what's the first category of that diet that becomes trending that you start to see in the grocery stores. And when I look back and it's like, it's always desserts, always, you know, plant-based desserts, keto desserts. Now you're even seeing carnivore desserts. You're seeing before that you saw paleo desserts. Before that it was Atkins and before that it was fat free. You know what I mean? It's always desserts. So it's always playing off of our, our addictions and it's not really changing anything. Right. So I've always kind of looked at food like, okay, I, I see people are having a B C D issue. Um, we're all gravitating towards comfort foods. So I wasn't, I was interested, well, how do I then make comfort foods healthier for people? And so I've always kind of looked at food from that lens. And throughout my career, I'm always like, well, okay, what's the most nutrient-dense food? And, and at different points of my awareness, it would be one thing and then another. And it, when I first became a chef, it was all about how you prepared things. So like even if you did grains or beans or, or – um, well, for grains and beans, it would be like, okay, did you soak them first? You know, did you help to make it more digestible? Um, later on, it was like cultured vegetables or anything that was naturally fermented so that it would support digestion as well. But then eventually it got to, well, what is the most nutrient-dense food? Because I'm still seeing that 93% of Americans are, nutri are, 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 are nutrient deficient. So I'm like, well that's an issue because we're not calorie deficient. So how do we, how do I support people in getting these nutrients when we're clearly, we're eating plenty of food where it's like 73% of men and 63% of women are, are overweight or obese, right? It's a huge number. And so we need help with the food choices. So, that, so that's when I was like, okay, what are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet? And I'm doing some searching, you know, Mr. Google or, or, and, and it's like, oh, I'm noticing whenever these, these charts come up that there's beef liver on there and it's knocking everything out of the water, even beef, like knocking it out of the water. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But there's, there's hurdles here because clearly we know organ meats are, they've been around forever, literally, right? Um, millions of years. And it's like, we're, so what, why are we not eating them? Well, we have this associated idea, this idea that they're going to be icky. And, and it's funny, even if people haven't tasted them, they think they're going to be icky, which is fascinating to me. Two, we, we don't know how to cook them. We've lost the art of cooking them. Most people overcook their organs when, even when they do it. And so they're like, oh, why is it so, this texture, why is it like that? It's because you overcooked it. What's the best way to cook organs? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll okay, share that because okay, that's cool. a great way. Absolutely, I'll share that. Um, and then the third thing is sourcing. And so so I was like, how do I solve that? And so what what Pluck is, is, is I took the freeze-dried powdered organ meat that you're already finding in capsules, but I combined it with spices, organic spices and herbs to offset that taste because I want you to eat your organ meats. I don't want you to just swallow them in capsule form because when we swallow things in capsule form, it's, it's really guesswork. You know, you buy these bottles of, of encapsulated organ meats and they'll say like, have six capsules. Well, how do they know what you need versus what I need with versus what she needs versus what that child needs? Like 
it isn't possible to know what everyone's needs are. We're all bio individuals, right? But when you eat it, your body will tell you what it needs. And salt is a perfect example. If I put salt on your tongue, your body will immediately say, oh, give me more. Or it will say like, uh, I don't need any more. Like it's immediate. It's instantaneous. But if you swallow a salt tablet, it's delayed 15, 20 minutes later. You're like, why am I bloated? Oh, I got too much salt. When we swallow that nutrition, it is a guessing game. But when we eat it, our body gives the feedback of what it needs. So I'm all about uh, like eat it. It's okay if it's freeze dried. It's okay if it's whole. It doesn't matter to me in that regard. What matters to me is that I, we need to get in our diet because our food is not as nutritious. So I combine those ingredients and basically solved all those hurdles. And even more importantly is it's not a new habit. So, you know, health, and this was very evident during COVID, but health is only as good as we do it. So, and how many people, like I always think of Suzanne Summers, and this is not a joke on her, not to knock her down. She's an amazing uh, entrepreneur. She's an amazing businesswoman. Kudos to her. But you might be too young for this, but maybe some listeners will remember she had this thigh thing, this device that you put in your thighs and it's kind of V-shaped and you would do, you know, do this kind of thing. It was like thigh master or something like okay, that. Yeah, yeah. And it was hugely popular. Like freaking everyone bought it. I was too young to buy it, but I'm just saying I remember the commercials. I remember you'd see them in garage sales everywhere, and that says everything right there. Is people bought it, but I guarantee they probably used it a month. And then it was in the garage and later in a garage sale. And same thing with some of those Jane Fonda videos, you know, Jazzercise, all that stuff. And so I just look at all that stuff, and I'm like, man, this is like the illusion of health if we don't do it. It doesn't – I'm not saying the person who created it is malicious or trying to – it's not snake oil. It's only snake oil if you don't use it. And so I love the fact that I that this inadvertently is be, by turning that organ meat back into a food, I'm making it so there's no new habit because we already season our food. All I'm saying is switch out the current seasoning you use and use this ancestral superfood powder that we've created and put that on your food. And now... It's effortless. And when health is a habit that you do daily and don't have to think about it, and it doesn't matter what emotional state you're in, you're just doing it. Now we've got something. Now we've got something you're going to do no matter if there's COVID 4.0, you're going to do it because it's easy and it's delicious. So that to me is like, that's the future. Like we got to tap that. We got to tap that because people need help. So... I'm grateful that that is just happens to be what pluck is. Um, and, and, and so that is, that is pluck. And that is, it's basically, we call it the gateway to getting organs into your diet. I, to your point of asking, so what is the best way of eating organs? I don't want you to necessarily stop at pluck. My goal is to get you to eat whole animal. When we slaughter a grass fed cow, that that's what we're all told to eat, right? hundred percent grass fed cow, right? When we slaughter that cow, the muscle meat is something like 48%, something like that. The other 51, 52% is organ. It's, it's like, it's what we call awful. So it's the, it's the bone marrow. It's every part of the animal except the, the well, it's including bone, but, but it's basically every other part of the animal. And so my whole point is like the same 100% grass-fed cow we're already slaughtering that cow, but where is that other 52 or 50 ish percent of that animal going? And it's really, it's, it's either being designated as not for human consumption, so it's going to pet foods industry, or it's going to some other industry, or it's getting tossed in many cases. So, and then yet we turn around and we spend $50 billion on, on supplements. And I'm like, w w this is mother nature supplement. Like this is as mother nature intended, it's, 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 it's one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. It's bioavailable, meaning you can easily absorb it. And yet we're not eating it. So my 
mission is to support you in getting those other parts of the animal that we're discarding or giving to some other species right now. So, so what, uh, so pluck is just the beginning point, but I don't want you to stop there. I would love it if people ate organ meats. And so how I kind of like walk people through easing into the organ meats is, uh, so you start with like pluck, like I said, it's a gateway, easy, easy start. And it's delicious. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I think so too. And dude, it, I, I was telling you, my mom and I, when I first moved down to Austin like two months ago, we went up to the farmer's market. We got some, you know, local grass-fed beef. We got some raw goat cheese. We got, and then we seasoned, we made burgers and we seasoned them with pluck. And we literally took a bite and looked at each other like, this is, this might be the best burger we've ever eaten, you know? It's, and it, it almost, it makes you not even want to go out to the restaurant. Like, when you know you're eating like something local um, that is, you know, well sourced and you know you're getting your the organs within within there and it just tastes delicious like it's like why, why would i why would i go buy meat anywhere else you know as a parent i love it because my kids they put it on everything and they know what it is but i talk to other parents who buy pluck and they're like yeah i don't even tell my kid what it is but they love it and i'm like it's a win because you know, that's all you want. You want that for yourself. You want that for your family. You just, you, you just want to be healthy. You know, you want to have longevity. And, and, um, and I really believe that it's these, these nutrient dense foods that are going to help us get there. And, um, and very much so whole animal from, from, from my, my investment. And yeah, so thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you find it delicious. I, 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 I use it. I mean, I put it on everything. I mean, uh, like I said, I didn't grow up eating organ meats, and I don't typically cook organ meats, but I eat pluck mm -hmm. all the time. Do you, do you season your, do you eat organs and season them in pluck? I have, but I still don't gravitate toward it. And one of the reasons is because even though I know, yeah, I want to eat organs, but the reality is, is, is I'm a parent of two young kids and I work all day. And so I don't want to be in the kitchen too long because if I am, uh, it takes away from my family time. But also I'm like, I'm kind of done at the end of the day. Right. So I want, I just want quick and easy meals. And, and sometimes if you're really, if you're acclimated and familiar with cooking organ meats, they can be quick and eat like liver and onion is very quick, but you got to build that. And one thing that you face as parents, particularly, well, I was a pick eater, but one thing you face as parents is that you don't want to make a meal and then have someone in your family say, I don't want to eat that, mm -hmm. right? You just don't want the headache. You don't want the argument. You don't want the picky eating. You don't want any of it. You just want to, you want at the end of the day, everything to be smooth and easy, you know? And, and so a lot of times, and I've talked to homesteaders. I mean, I've talked to so many people in the industry around this stuff and, and they're like, yeah, I'll make pate, which is has organ meat in it. And no one in my family eat it. So I'll just eat it. I'm like, yeah, that's the reality is we still have those hurdles that I talked about earlier and it, it, the kids have them as well. And some people are very sensitive to the taste. So I just gravitate towards easy, easy and delicious. That's what I gravitate towards. But obviously I want it to be healthy. And, and so, so the three of those together, how do I achieve that? Well, I put pluck on everything. It's just so easy. It's delicious. It makes the food taste better. And my kids love it. I mean, I got my, my seven-year-old, she was excited to eat broccoli because I put pluck on it. It's the first time in the entire world where you got you get a kid to eat their vegetable because you put organ meats on it. Like that's unheard of. It's so bizarre. Um, but the, but my mission is to get people to eat whole animals. So so to your question, I would ease into it. so so after pluck, I would then look for some blends that already have organ meats in them. Force of Nature does. There's there's a multitude of companies that have what they call sometimes ancestral blends or uh, primal blends, and they already have some organs in them. So that's always a good step. But then you're locked into it's got to be ground meat, you know, that you're using it for, which is great if you're doing spaghetti sauce or I don't know stews and things like that. Um, but for the, someone who wants it differently then i said then after that i would focus on chicken and it's not because it's necessarily the most nutritious i think the beef uh, cow is still is still going to be more nutritious but it's an easy entry and the key is we're working on just getting you acclimated to eating organs and their taste right and chicken hearts are very mild they take on the flavor of whatever you're doing and what i focus on when i'm trying to in 
get someone to eat organs is I focus on changing the uh, texture to to meet what works for their favorable like we all have kind of textures we gravitate towards some people are really creamy some are crispy right it varies and then we we gravitate towards taste so i'm looking for and then of course we we eat with our eyes as well we order with our eyes that kind of concept so i make sure that it doesn't look like a heart so that chicken heart i cut it up i treat it like a mushroom when you buy chicken hearts it's usually in a container there might be 10 12 in there maybe 15 just like mushrooms when you buy a box of mushrooms there's like you know, 10, 12 in there. And so I just pull out two, three hearts, just like you would a mushroom, chop them up. So now they don't look like a heart and I throw them in whatever I'm making. And I guarantee no one will know because I'm keeping the ratio of the heart smaller or lower than the other meat that's in there, the, the muscle meat that's in there. And so that ratio is important, N not having it look like an organ to scare anyone off and then that they don't taste it really key right and then after that i would then move on to like tongue beef tongue and beef tongue is amazing now it's over it's intimidating because you see it and it looks like a tongue and you're like oh it's a tongue <laughs> but you could what i like to do is kind of take the piss out of things and like have fun with them so like like anyone listening to this you can buy that tongue first of all it's going to be from the same 100 percent grass-fed cow that that ribeye that cost you know 26 dollars a pound is but this will cost a lot less it's more like six or seven dollars a pound so you're saving money it's more nutritious than that ribeye and it's actually got more flavor and so that's one thing and then you can kind of also have fun with it you can like put it up and take pictures and you know share them on your social media like you're like gene simmons from kiss or something you know what I mean? like just take the piss out of it like don't take it so seriously but have fun with it it's like ah cow tongue on a human whatever and then just find a good recipe and you can find one on our site. Either it's eatpluck.com uh, and we have a recipe section and we have tongue taco recipe and it's freaking amazing. And once you actually cook it, you start to see how easy it is and how delicious. And if you're intimidated, let's just say a lot of families, a lot of people do t uh, taco Tuesdays, right? So whatever meat you're cooking for your taco Tuesday, as long as it's not ground meat. So I'm, I'm just saying like carnitas or even, um, uh, chuck roast or anything like that um, basically take that cook it the same way but add the tongue to it so if you're braising it or you're slow cooking it or even pressure cooking it put the tongue in there too you end up kind of pressure cooking it or slow cooking it for a few hours and once you go to pull out that tongue it, you'll see that actually that little that kind of tough skin on that's on the outside peels right off and what's underneath is this really kind of delicious muscle meat and then chop it all up together so let's just say you made carnitas right so you made pork you did pork shoulder or pork butt with the tongue now you you uh, chop up the tongue you chop up the carnitas or string it whatever you want to do pull pull the pork whatever and then combine them really well with the sauce no one will know it's in there but they will all go wow this is so delicious and now you've exposed yourself to tongue and once again, you're acclimating your palate. Your palate is getting more and more acclimated to these flavors. And now you will find that you actually start to gravitate more towards them. And that's really all you got to do. You got to do it long enough for it to become something you now are conditioned to, which then becomes craveable. But you got to do it long enough to make it craveable. But I guarantee anything you do in life and you do it long enough, you will then, it will become effortless. It's just that is how life is, right? The more we do something, the easier it gets. And the same thing goes with food. So I know you mentioned you were vegan for a while. You've done, uh, I know, I remember listening to you with uh, with my guys, Harry and Brett, on, on Meat Mafia. You talked about, was it the raw primal? Yes. That, that oh, my did? God. That was so you, amazing. So you've done a, you, you've tried a couple of different diets. You've been in the industry for a long time. What have been the ones that have worked for you the most and what have you kind of what have you pulled from that and, and what does your like daily diet nutrition look like on a day-to-day -day basis now well so i have to uh i have to share then because the raw primal really worked the, the yeah, best yeah yeah it, I, it, i'd never heard of that please, it, please. it was amazing so uh raw primal is basically you're eating raw animal products so you you really got your source from very quality uh, meats and you also want to make sure they've been frozen for like 14 days at least in the freezer and um 
So we would get like some really good buffalo. A lot of it was ground meat, admittedly. Um, and we would do that. We would do oysters. We would do uh, sashimi style stuff too. Um, sushi grade fish. Um, we would do raw honey. We did raw dairy. And, um, and then of course some like, like parsley, like any, we could do even some vegetables raw, but obviously only the vegetables that you were okay to eat raw, you know, you know what I mean? Um, but primarily what, what we would do and we did it for 30 days, um, is the meat raw and some raw dairy as well. And we would do these like, I mean, it, it fluctuated, but like we did, um, we would take the raw meat and make almost like these meatballs and I'd make them small enough. Cause I found if I made them too big, it, I, I had a little bit of a gag at first. Cause I'm, I grew up in a household where we knew dinner was ready cause the smoke detector went off. Like, like it was like everything was extremely well cooked. So me going raw, it was really hard. Cause once again, I'm not acclimated to it. My wife was very acclimated. She loves raw meat. I mean, she used to eat it as a kid because she would gravitate she instinctively would go to it um and so for her it was not a hurdle at all but we would do this and we both felt amazing we, we ended up i i was very carnivorous meaning i was like eating lots of meat and kind of still not satiated which was interesting i ended up learning at one point that i had a um i had a gosh what's it called um a parasite mm. I had a parasite, and once I eradicated that, I wasn't as meat hungry. So that was kind of interesting. But this was before raw, uh, raw primal. Then when I was a raw primal, I was finding that I actually didn't eat as much. Like I ate less and felt completely satiated. And my digestion was spectacular. My energy was amazing. My sleep was amazing. Like I didn't need any supports. It was so good. But here's the rub. It wasn't practical. And I know there's some people out there that I know this guy, Max, he, he lives like this and it's like, he's making it work. But like, we just, we had a young baby at the time and we're like, well, we really can't eat out very much unless we're eating like sushi all the time. Um, but you can't really eat out like that. You can't really go to parties or dinner parties with people because no one else is eating like that. And then with kids, you don't necessarily want to give them raw primal when they're still building their immune systems and they're, you know, they could get sick. So it's like, it just wasn't practical. And once again, it defaults to the humanity piece. It's like, it only works if it works for you. You know what I mean? Like, if, like it's the same thing with the health I was talking about. If you don't do it, then it doesn't work. Um, that's why I'm always telling people with pluck, I'm like, do not treat this like nutmeg. Don't use it once a year. Like you got to use it every meal daily to get the benefits that's the point um so i'm i'm just yeah so that was a big one that really worked but it just wasn't practical so i think where i'm at now is it's kind of a hybrid like so i'm probably i'm definitely eating a more variety of animal based foods um i eat fish i eat um beef uh i eat poultry even and I kind of just try to listen to my body because I'll eat beef like a lot and but then I'll just start craving like chicken thigh and I'm like well I'm gonna listen to that I'm just gonna do it you know and I'll, I'll I love getting my chickens from Cook's Venture because it's a really clean company and I I, I know the CEO is a really quality guy and I, I I believe in their products so that's where I get my chickens and um and you can find them um uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll do, this is this is news breaking. News breaking, really. And a lot of people don't know this. So when you go to Trader Joe's and you see their pasture raised chicken, that's Cook's Venture. Ah, okay. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. All right, I'm gonna make my way over to Trader Joe's then. Yeah. There you go. So it's a way to get Cook's Venture if you can't find them in your other, you know, areas. Um, but they're really quality because they focus on breed. They focus on how it's fed they focus on how long it lives really really good stuff um um and so so sometimes i crave the chicken stuff sometimes i'm craving fish sometimes i crave lamb i just kind of follow it there's one thing though that i try i'm really actually conscious to try to move away from and that's pork um i was gonna ask you about that yeah what are your thoughts on pork pork is an interesting one it's a very sweet meat naturally and 
it's you know of course anyone that eats bacon i know bacon is su- consciously sweetened but it's just it's just something that um that we we're all very acclimated to eat particularly if you eat bacon like and particularly talk carnivores and ketos they're going crazy on bacon right um but here's something that a lot of people either don't know or don't talk about which is that it does your your blood um it changes your blood for a few hours and you can go to like Wise uh, Weston A. Price and look up the study they've done. And not a lot of people have studied this, but but eating it changes your blood. I'm not saying it necessarily changes it permanently. It's just for a few hours. But it is kind of interesting that, you know, pork is closest to human meat, which is interesting. Mm. Um, it's also in a lot of religions, historically, it's one that they don't eat. And I know that that's tied to uh, hygiene and, you know, conditions. But I, I look at, cultural foods and, and historical foods. And I, and I kind of look for a little bit more than that. Like I, I think that a lot of times they knew stuff that we have lost. Um, and that sometimes we may not understand why this culture does that thing, but I think it's, um, potentially for deeper reasons than we even think. And I, and I actually think that a lot of religions and cultures don't eat pork for more than just the age old, you know, hygiene, you know, because meat at the time, a lot of people are getting sick, but I think it's deeper than that. And I wonder sometimes if they're tapped into, or they were tapped into kind of a more of an energetic kind of awareness around that. This isn't so good for us because when you look at that study, the only way you were able to make pork not change your blood was if you, um, was if you, uh, basically, um, cured it in some way so like or soaked it in like apple cider vinegar or buttermilk like where you did something to it to support the meat in making it maybe more digestible or something so it's kind of interesting and that's kind of why i'm trying to move away from it because i find um the same thing for me was with nuts like i find when i start grab when i start kind of like using foods as a crutch and those are my go-to things when I'm like hungry or like default. I'm always eating this meat because like, because it's sweet. And you think about pork, if you try to get sausages, ba- I mean, think about everything that any kind of pork product usually gets tied to sweet. Mm-hmm. You notice that? It's like, it's always sweet. Even if you buy hot sausage, they still put sugar in it. It's crazy. Right? It's just like, what? It's and so and I think it is kind of it's kind of like the same thing of what hot Cheetos do. It's like they know um, that if they put like for every I don't know if like for every five of the Cheetos, if four of them are spicy and one is not, they know that we'll keep eating it because it's like you give your palate a break for a second and then you just want that that you want that hit again, that stimulus again. So there's something about you know sweet salty you know as americans we really kind of um stay in that realm a lot so i'm always trying to make sure that if i'm defaulting to something as and it becomes a crutch that i that's the sign that i'm i need to move away from it and like for nuts sometimes i'm getting too much fat you know or um sometimes i'm filling my hunger or I'm emotionally eating with it you know so i just kind of monitor that and so pork for me became that thing of like you know it, this is too easy and I'm clearly like tapping that sweet part of my palate. And, uh, so I need to change that up, you know? And, um, and so I've been trying to wean myself off of that. And I, I already, I'm not eating as much bacon as I used to. And I really, uh, it's fun. It's, I, I like kind of keeping myself sharp. It's no different than someone that goes into the gym and is like, they, they mix up their exercise to keep their body guessing and keep, keep it really working and not getting acclimated to one condition. Right. It's no different. I just try to do that with my diet and my food choices as well. However, I say that and my food choices have not diverged from I'm always whole food. Always. Like I, I am not a ultra processed eater guy at all. And I, and I haven't even eaten fast food since I was, uh, I mean, like over 30, I mean, probably about 30 years or more. I haven't had it. You know I mean? I, I don't do sodas, you know, things like that. There's certain things that once I wean myself of it, I, I, I just don't touch. I haven't bought a candy bar in a long time. I mean, I, I don't even remember the last candy bar I had. You know what I mean? Like once you know, it's your job to own that 
and use your intelligence to move now to the next stage. It's it's like that Angela uh, Maya Angelou uh, um, quote, which is once you you know you, you what is it you do good until you know better, and now you do better. You, you know what I mean? It's like you, once again you only know what you know, but once you know, now it's on you if you if you go backwards. Like once you know this food hurts you then now you are consciously hurting yourself. Well, unfortunately, I think people don't know what it feels like to really like thrive. Totally. You know, when you're eating whole foods, nutri nutrient dense foods on a daily basis, you're getting enough water, you're getting sunlight, you're getting good sleep, you're cutting out processed foods, you're cutting out sugar, you're cutting out seed oils, you feel freaking amazing. And then when you look at a plate of grass fed beef, you know, maybe got some like some raw cheese in there. You've got some other good stuff. And then you look at like a Kit Kat. That food is information. Both of those are information. And for me, like I can look at this plate on the right and I can say, yeah, I'm going to feel amazing after I eat this. And I can look at that food on the left. I'm going to say, yeah, this is going to give me a huge rush of dopamine for 12 seconds. And then I'm going to feel like crap and I'm going to sleep terribly. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to feel groggy. I'm going to feel achy. You don't realize what it what that does to you until you have cut it out of your diet for that long. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, you you have to be willing to feel the pain or feel whatever it does to you. And a lot of people just check out, right? And so here's the simple, simple but hard fix. So it's simple in concept, hard to actually do. But it's but if you can get past the first four days, it actually gets easier. You cut out. For two weeks only, so 14 days, anyone can do this. Cut out any sweets, cut out alcohol, cut out grains, cut out um, simple carbs, you know, um, I don't know, pastas, whatever, any any of those kind of starches like that, potatoes, cut out all that kind of, those those starches. And then, um, and then cut out fruits that are very high in fructose, so like pineapple, mangoes. So really try to stick to just some berries, right? You can still do animal meat. You can still do, you can't do soy because you're cutting out the carbs. You're trying to cut out even beans. You can do, if you really need the beans, you can do a little bit or legumes, but. You but, don't need them. No, you don't need them. Exactly. <laughs> so you're really focused on animal products. You're also cutting out dairy, right? So Even raw dairy. Yes. Okay. Okay. So all you're eating is meat. You're eating fat, but not dairy fat, just any other kind of fat. So you can eat nuts. You can eat, um. You can eat uh, tallow, lard, butter, because uh, I, I don't count the butter as dairy only because it's mostly fat. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people can do that, but try to, if you can cut it out, you'll see even bigger gains, but sure. it, 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 it's not that big a deal with butter. Um, but cheeses are. And so you cut out kind of, you really what you're doing is you're cutting out all the main potential allergens and then you're also cutting out the grains and the starches, okay? Mm -hmm. So meat, fat, and then um, and then you're getting... You said like low, low, on, low on the GI scale fruits. Yeah, so like you're berries. maybe eating, uh, I wouldn't even do strawberries because those are too sweet. So you're eating blueberries, uh, blackberries or raspberries. Okay? okay. And you're only eating, you don't want to eat more than a handful, but, Got it. and then that's what you do. And you could still have like, like, um, you could still have like low glycemic, um, uh, like produce. So you can have as many of that, that, that you want. So if you this say you want like butternut squash, you can have it. Mm. Um, you don't want to do necessarily, you can do sweet potatoes, but once again, you don't want to get, those can be very sweet because they're, they're kind of manipulated. They're hy hybridized at this point. So they, they're very, very ultra sweet. So you just want to be careful of anything that's overly sweet, right? Um, if you need to, you can do a little stevia. You can still do your coffee if you want, but you're just not putting dairy in it, okay? Two weeks, eat like that. And what happens is not only do you end up losing weight and inflammation because you cut all these things out, but you also recalibrate your palate. So let's just say a lot of people that do this, they'll enter it drinking two to three glasses of wine a night they can barely finish a glass after two weeks because they really they suddenly now taste how sweet it is mm. the same thing with fruit like they go to bite an apple and they're like oh my gosh it's like candy that's all you need you just need to recalibrate 
you need a like you said you need a, a, a you need a moment of pulling back from what it is that you're so hooked into or addicted to to then have contrast so now you know what your body feels without it and then you move forward from there now the hardest part after doing two weeks is not then fall like just throwing it all out the window you know you really do want to ease in, into it and if you ease into it properly you'll actually discover what foods are causing these issues because mm. you'll immediately feel bloated or you'll immediately feel like you'll see things pop up like rashes or something because in that 14 days a lot of things c- kind of clear up which is miraculous i had so in my meal delivery service back in the day we offered this to people so we had just our whole food kind of based plan but then we had our what we call our sugar control which was exactly what i'm describing i had this guy and this happened to a lot of people but i love this story i had this guy come to me and he told me afterwards so he did the two weeks and then he said hey i just wanted you to know how much this changed me and i'm like well thank you but what do you what do you mean he said well i had gone to the doctor i was pre-diagnosed uh i was diagnosed with pre as a pre-diabetic for type 2 and my doctor wanted to put me on meds and I asked him just to hold off and I just did your program for two weeks and then I had him retest me and I'm no longer pre-diabetic. Wow. Two weeks. And he said, and then his doctor said, what did you do? And he said, well, I changed the way I eat. And his doctor said, no, really, what did you do? And he said, that doctor is no longer my doctor because he doesn't <laughs> believe that food will change my health. It's insane. Like, so it works. I mean, but it's, it, but it's hard. The first four days are super hard because most of us are burning the calories that we're burning is sugar and so it's almost like you've been um feeding your energy with kindling and when you start to feed it logs which is the fat you know and the protein that transition is great it's hard but you just a lot of people on keto talk about this for like once you get into ketosis everything's easier but getting into ketosis is hard because your body's not in ketosis so it's a hump it's a hump to get over and the same thing with pulling all these foods that, you know, spike your blood sugar so quickly out of your diet. Mm. I wanted to ask you quickly too, what are your thoughts on, you know, certain vegetables? Because I was a guy who used to eat like, dude, I, every, every part of my plate, I was like, I would have a huge, I would have spinach and I would have broccoli or cauliflower or kale. Dude, I was like, you know, five to 10 servings a day. I guess I thought that's what I, I thought that was what, health looked like right like always trying to get the greens in right i have since like the only real vegetables that i really eat are like zucchini and cucumbers and like mushrooms and my gut health is the best it's been my inflammation is so much lower my brain health is so much better i'm not getting the brain fog and I, I don't really know how to explain it because it's so crazy because I've always, you know, we've grown up like eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables. So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious what, uh, what's your experience been with that? Well, let me ask you, did you make any other changes, but cut those vegetables out? Cause that's the one thing. And this is more the point. This is what happens a lot when people go from the standard American diet to then being vegan and they're like, Oh my God, it's so amazing. It's like, well, yeah, but it, it, you could have gone omnivore or, or, keto or, or, or carnivore there it's more the act of you getting off the standard american diet mm-hmm. that has made you have all these gains mm-hmm. you could have done any other diet and you would have felt amazing right you just you're getting off that ultra processed food right so i so to that point i'm just wondering did you also cut off anything else or was it just the vegetable change yeah so it was the vegetable change and then also cutting out grains so so it, that does beg the question yeah. which of them cause the most gut health right you know increase right i don't know that answer for you but that i'm only asking because i think i think it really is like some people do okay with vegetables you know what i mean and if they do great you know what i mean um i'm not i'm not a guy i'm not like a i'm not dogmatic about like like what works for me has got to work for you it's like i really do believe we are bio individual there's i rarely meet anyone where the vegan diet truly works for but i have met some Mm -hmm. and they're athletes it's like okay i've never met anyone else it's a very small percentage but it's like and even the people when i used to have my meal delivery i would i would meet so many people that'd be doing plant-based but then of course it was just called vegan um and and i would see them and they'd be on it and 
you know, they would be so overweight and they wouldn't realize, like they would think it was healthier. I'm like, but look at you, you don't, your body does not look healthy and you, you clearly don't look, you know, you, you're not healthy, like, cause you're having all this other stuff going on, you know what I mean? But they would think that that was the answer. And I'm just like, well, you just let your body tell you. Like if you're feeling good and yes, you, you cut out grains and those vegetables, then to me, then that is that you don't even need me to answer because your body told you this works, whatever you did, it works. And that is, that is really ultimately the best lesson is I, it goes back to what we talked earlier. I want people to get more in touch with what their body tells them. And the biggest, I think, mistake anyone makes is they get in their head about it. They think like, well, but so-and-so, you know, um, you know, Joe Saladino says to do this and then Huberman says to do that and, and Asprey says to do that, you know, and, and it's very confusing because in most cases, everyone has got a different message. Huge. Um, and, but you know whose message is not confusing is when you just kind of settle into your own body. And I'm, I'm always telling people that whatever journey you go down with your health, do it. Like we talked about earlier, honor that journey, but you know the one person you need to listen to that's going to give you immediate feedback around it is your body. So if you start going plant-based and then you suddenly feel like like bloated and digestive, you got a lot, a lot of flatulence going on or whatever, that's your body telling you, this ain't working. And if you start getting rashes, this ain't working. If you start having trouble sleeping, this ain't working. And that could be for any diet. I mean, there's a lot of people that... They go carnivore and they're like constipated. And I know some people say, well, you just got to do it longer. And that may be true, but you got to listen to your own body. I mean, you, you got to. Um, for me, what I do is I also don't eat that many vegetables now. And I agree with you. It's very confusing out there. But I will find that I still crave vegetables sometimes. And when I do, I follow that crave. I follow it. But then there's other times where I don't. Now, I am. I tend to default to something I mentioned, Bill Schindler, I think uh, eats like him. I mentioned him earlier. Now he and I are kind of on the same page with this is that, you know, the, the, every species out there has got an advantage in some way. You know, some animals have talons and claws and sharp teeth and some have very short digestive systems so they can eat very acidic foods and it's good. Well, we, we've evolved where a lot of, we really don't have those things what we do have is a very powerful brain right in a much in, in in a sense uh on a certain level that's our advantage it allows us to think things but it also gets us in trouble right but what that does in that brain and it allows us to create tools that then provide the um kind of the solution that our our internal systems don't have. So like I mentioned earlier, fermenting vegetables, right? Fermenting vegetables is a way of pre-digesting and making that vegetable more bioavailable and easier in your system. And what does fermenting mean? Fer, ferme, so in our air, we have natural bacteria in our air. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're doing, I'm, I'm going to probably mess this up, but what we're doing with... Um, fermented vegetables is you can kind of culture them in many ways. You can add a culture to it. You can use like whey from, from yogurt. Um, but you can also just do air culturing and what you're doing. A lot of times they use cabbage and they're taking that green cabbage and they're mashing it till the juices of the cabbage come out and then they're removing the oxygen. So you're putting it in like a Mason jar and you're, rem you're submersing the cabbage so that it's in its ju the juices. And then you're removing the oxygen from it so then that way bacteria can't grow. And then you're making sure that the top of it is allowing air to come in. And that natural bacteria starts to basically ferment that vegetable. And in many ways, it's decomposing the vegetable, right, in a certain regard. But because it's submerged and it's not, you're not allowing the oxygen into it, it actually makes that vegetable healthier for you. It, mm -hmm. it, it makes it more digestible. It brings the, the nutrients that are in it, makes them more accessible. Um, cause that's one of the reasons why a lot of people tell you not to eat vegetables is because those vegetables and grains and all those, those other things, they are living organisms and they have protection, 
you know, one of the reasons why you can eat certain grains like corn and stuff, and then you see them in your poop is because that is their protect. They're protecting themselves because they know if an animal eats them, that is how they're going to grow more corn, create more like little vegetable babies, right? It's because that animal is going to eat it. It's not going to penetrate its, its hole or whatever it's eaten. And then it's later going to come out in the feces and then grow, you know, and propagate more whatever it is, grain or whatever seeds or whatever it is, right? So what we're doing is we're, we're tricking that organism to lower its defenses when we ferment. And we're bringing out the nutrients because it does have nutrients. They all, I don't think anyone will disagree with this, is produce does have nutrients. It's just we need to figure out how to use our brains to access those nutrients um, in ways that don't harm us. And fermentation is a perfect example. I, I, saw a, I saw a post from somebody who said, I think it was Paul Saladino, who said that anything that you can find in, like there's nothing in plant food that you can't find in or like plants that you can't find in animals in terms of like vitamins minerals nutrients is that is that true to, to your to your knowledge i mean i'm not i mean he's you know he's a doctor he's got a very i mean he's got a very perspective uh, specific perspective and i know he's got a brand that he's trying to you know yeah, grow exactly. right yeah, animal-based yeah. brand so he's not going to diverge from that and you know i mean that's that's something you got to be aware of anyone is like well what is is there a message around selling their brand which for most people it is and, mm -hmm. and it's always important to just remember it's like you're only like you know like um like when you when you see a documentary film we we tend to default to think well that's the truth of that event but it's it's a lens and i guarantee you're you're seeing a very specific perspective of that event there could have been things outside of that lens that would have change your perspective on that event but you don't see them because someone pointed the camera at that right. pers specific perspective the same thing is happening with diets you know paul saladino is is doing great work and he's got a brand that he's pushing and even he started out with carnivore diet right and now he's calling it animal but he, like he's adjusting things yep right? To either distinguish it or to kind of um, honor the changes that he's discovered in his own body, which uh, um, you hope is the case. But I'm just, once again, I go back to what's good for one person may not be good for another. And either way, we still all have to unravel from this, th this journey in our food. Like, like, you know, a lot of times what, why a family sees the same chronic disease and they, why they classify it as genetic is because they're all still eating the same way. Sure. It's not necessarily genetics that's making them fat. It's It could just be that they continue on the same path of eating the same food. At least that's what I tend to believe. And to think that that can't be changed is false. I mean, even you mentioned Meat Mafia guys, Brett. I mean, Brett, Brett is changing the course of his family by changing how he's eating because he got sick so at such a young age. But he was eating the way he was taught to eat. But now that he's eating differently, it's probably going to, if he should have kids down the road, their kids will now completely, he could reverse that genetic, you know, thing that was going on for his family around, you know, around his, I think it was his heart, I think, right? I, 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 he had a IBS. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I couldn't remember exactly. But whatever it was, it's like he's potentially shifting that for future generations. Um, but it's got to start somewhere. Uh, it, it, so, so. Is, is meat the only, well, so here's another question is like, okay, um, is, is muscle meat all we need? Well, if you talk to Bill Schindler, who's an archeolo, he's a professor of archeology. span He's looking back at historically, how did we eat? Right? So we started out as foragers. Then we became scavengers, which we did get muscle meat then, but not much changed evolutionary wise. What ultimately changed is when we suddenly got a tool. And it was a very rudimentary tool, but it was a tool, and it turned us into a predator. Now, when you're a scavenger, the predator takes the prize, the prize, the choice, most nutrient-dense stuff. They instinctively take the things that are going to give them the most bang for their, their time and energy in killing that animal, right? But when we became the predator, now we got that. And you know what it was? It was three things. It was blood, fat, and organs. And once we got those everything evolved everything changed of course it took some time but that is the point where they're like that's where things really changed we got fire around that time which also helped but that's what developed into language it involved more tools it basically got us to where we are now 
And so from that perspective, those carnivores are saying, well, you only need muscle meat. I'm like, well, but we had muscle meat and as scavengers and it still didn't change much. So I'm, I'm just a whole animal. I just believe that it's the whole animal that matters. And then there's some people that'll be like, well, but I eat liver every day. I'm like, okay, so if we were a tribe of, you know, 32 people and we killed an animal, how many livers are there? There's one. How many hearts are there? There's one. You know, there's two kidneys, but they're small, right? So it's like how much of the 32 of us are actually getting that specific organ? Probably not much. It's probably going to the people that are sick. It's probably going to the people that are pregnant. It's going to the people that need it the most. But what we are getting is whole animal. We're getting other parts. And, you know, we focus so much on the liver because it is nutrient dense, but the spleen has even more iron than the liver does, right? The heart has CoQ10. Like as long as we're spreading out that animal and we're intuitively eating, you know, and, and supporting those that need it when they need it, and as long as we're getting it in the long run, I think we win. But this idea that, you know, the people that are eating ribeye and that's all they're eating, like, think about that for a second. If we were ancestrally back in the day and we slaughtered an animal, and all we ate was the ribeye of that, that is literally the definition of insanity. The amount of energy and potential death that we went through to kill that animal and all we ate was the ribeye and we left the rest for buzzards, like that's insanity. And yet that's how people are eating. So I'm just, I just don't buy it. Now, like I said, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I'm just, I've just been in the field long enough to see that people have very specific motivations around their products. People, um, people are looking to find a unique voice and what's more unique than creating a diet named after you like Adkins did, or, you know, Joe Saldino's or Paul Saldino's doing with animal bait. You know, I mean, everyone is just doing what either fits their paradigm or fits their pocket, their, their financial pocket and, or what, what is working for them. But I don't buy this one diet for all. I just don't buy it. E even in that society where I'm saying whole animal, like even then, cause even within whole animal, like I was just with a friend of mine who, who's very ancestral and she, she gave me all her fatty cuts of meat from her, her, her meat share. And I was like, why? She's like, because I just find when I, when I get too much fat, fatty meats, it, I, it doesn't agree with me. Like, and she's just following her body. I'm like, see? See? Like, everyone is a little different. And what works for one may not work for another. And we have to honor that. Not necessarily a principle of like, well, everyone's got to eat this way. It's just, I don't, I don't agree with it. Yeah, I think my biggest takeaway from this conversation is just always to remain curious and don't be so dogmatic about things and don't be so closed minded because really like, you know, you shared multiple stories throughout this podcast of people who they went and one person just made a simple change. All they did was water. And then that just start, had this domino effect of, you know, make him making good choices, developing good habits. And then you also had somebody who tried the you know the, the the diet that you mentioned for for two weeks and his, his doctor was like no seriously what did you do right like he just was unhappy with where he was at and decided and he was curious on how he could make a change so i mean my, my biggest takeaway from this is just question everything you know try different things and you know just just listen to your body right like and, and you know you don't have to live on just ribeyes and ground beef right? <laughs> uh, even though they are delicious i mean yeah and they are they absolutely and honestly like i will be the first to tell you i never would have expected when i started down this path as a chef that i would be sitting here talking to you about whole animal and and, and organ meats i trained as a vegan vegetarian chef mm. and it's not that i was vegan and vegetarian when i trained but i was very much like oh I know this will give me the edge as a chef because there are lots of people out there that are chefs, but they don't know how to make vegan or vegetarian food, right? So I was, I was looking for the edge as a chef that something that would make me stand out and look at where it's taken me. I mean, it's like, I, I, I didn't grow up eating this stuff, but I just instinctively know that there, our society is not doing this anymore. And I believe we are suffering for it. And, and look at, and I know this is not a parallel thing. I know there's other things going on, but I find it very fascinating that in our culture, a culture that used to eat brain, that you see whole animal way, you know, back in the day, when I say ancestrally too, I'm talking about our grandparents. I'm not even talking about that long ago. They used to eat more parts of the animal like three, three generations ago. Absolutely. 
They were eating way more part of the animal. My mom, when she lived in Brooklyn, in freaking the city, right? But they used to go get chickens at live poultry shops. So they would go to the place. There would be living chicken right there in a cage. They'd pick one. They'd go away, come back after an hour and a half, and then they would have this warm carcass all ready for them to go take home to cook. Wow. That is how intimate they were with their food. And that's just her generation. So she's in her 70s. But go back even another step. They're even more intimate with their food. They're, even, they're eating more whole animal, right? And yet look at our society now. We are now at a place where people... Our, our, the chronic illness is so extreme, the amount of dementia, the amount of, the, the amount of Alzheimer's, and I just have to wonder, is this connected to the fact that we don't eat brain anymore? Because there's this whole concept of like supports like. And it's true if you look at it from a nutritional standpoint. The, the nutrition that's in heart of that animal actually is the nutrition that will help our heart. CoQ10 is in heart, right? Um, the, the nutrition that's in the liver will help our liver. The nutrition that's in the brain will help our brain. And I was talking to someone actually just today who eats brain, and they've eaten a long time in their life, and he is absolutely convinced his family is a uh, scientist even who just happened to have grown up eating very whole animal uh and he he is absolutely convinced that the reason why we're seeing so many of these health issues is because we're not eating these things because he's like when i eat brain i feel a focus that i never feel otherwise wow and that says something to me and I, so that's why I'm just like, look, I, I'm shocked as you are that I'm talking like this, but I truly believe in my heart of heart and, and, and all we got, and I'll, and I'll stop here cause I know I'm going off, but, but like all we have is our instincts. Okay. Well, no matter what faith you believe in, I do believe in something bigger than us. Okay. And I believe that it's our instincts that are our touch point to that bigger thing. And whether it's God, whatever you want to call it. I believe that it's our instincts that are unique to us, and it's, in a sense, that bigger presence speaking to us of what will help us. It's like the angel who's got your back kind of concept, right? So when you get these instincts, it's now your choice, just like with food, it's your choice of do you listen or do you not listen? Your choice. But you'll notice that you're going to keep getting these instincts, I just don't, this doesn't feel right. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to stay with this person. Ah, it just doesn't feel right. I'm going to stay with this person, right? These are people in destructive relationships. There's people that are making destructive food choices. Like you just keep getting these instincts. And I truly have learned in my life, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that my instincts are godly and that it is my job to listen to them. So when I get them, I listen, and I really listen and I, tr and I let them make the decision, the next decision. And so, I, yeah, I don't have the science to tell you all oh, whole animal will solve everything, but I just instinctively feel so, I so, I feel so strongly that this is what we are missing and that this will solve a lot. And if in many ways it may, could even heal the world and how it could do that is that if you feel better, if I can get you to feel better in your body, we treat people how we feel. So if you feel better in your body, then now you're treating people better. And once we start treating people better, now we have a better world. And now we have people that are actually listening to each other, respect each other. And now maybe we have more curiosity instead of this kind of like straight line of like, oh, you don't believe what I believe, then F you. You know what I mean? It's like, like we can change the world, but we have to first take, we have to feel like we have to focus on our health because our health will dictate every next decision. That's a mic drop right there. <laughs> that's that's good shit. Dude, uh, I just want to say thank you for everything that you brought to the table today. Again, no pun intended. But <laughs> I really appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, I love your product. I love the mission behind it. When you see, when you when you talk about Pluck, when you, when you think about the vision, where do you see it in, in five years, 10 years and beyond? Um, I want to, I want to, do even more whole animal. So, so I want to, I want to provide simple, delicious ways for people to get even more of that animal. I would love to get access to brain. Even I, I want to make it like, you know how they're taking mushrooms basically. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they're like, uh, well, this mushroom is for brain and this one is for uh, virility and that like, I want to do that, but whole animal and, and just truly make it accessible and delicious because 
that's really the hurdle. Like I can talk to him blue in the face, like gotta eat more whole animal, but no one's going to do it if it's not easy and, 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 and it doesn't fit their lifestyle. Just like I'm not doing raw primal anymore. Right. If it doesn't fit, if it's not practical, we're not going to do it for very long. And so that is my mission is to truly, to not only hit more parts of the animal, make them more accessible to people, but also hit other, other types of animals. So do it for chickens, fish, buffalo, elk, you know, what, just hit more animals because it's also diversity of species that I think that will, is also missing from our diet. I love that. Dude, this has been an incredible conversation. Thanks so much for chopping it up with me today. I got one question for you, and that's a question I ask all my guests. This is the Pure Ambition podcast. When you hear those words, pure ambition, what does that mean to you and how does it apply to your daily life? It's the path that has heart. Whatever path that has heart, follow that. It's, that's, that's pure to me and it's ambition. It's like you, you, you don't stay curious, stay on the path that has heart. I love it, man. James, appreciate all that you do. If people want to connect with you, if they want to find out more about Pluck, if they want to buy some, where are you hanging out? Where can they get it? Eatpluck.com. We're also on Amazon. Just search it. Pluck, you can put Pluck seasoning, organ-based seasoning. It will pop up. Uh, find us uh, on socials at Eat Pluck. And, uh, and then if you want to find me personally, I'm at Chef James Berry. Love it. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, Dom. It's been a pleasure. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. I wanted to give you all a heads up too that I launched a free community on the Upspace app where you can join, ask me questions, connect with like-minded individuals, follow my four-week running and strength training program that has some dedicated mobility sessions in there as well so that we can all optimize our health and fitness together. So if you're interested, head over to the App Store, download the Upspace app, and join the Pure Ambition community today. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.